Welcome to the DIY Writer Show with the mild-mannered, slightly heroic host, Jeff Bacon. This is Jeff with the DIY Writer Podcast, and today we have Chris Lodwig with us. He is the author of Systemic, which, you know, we're just going to jump into it. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing not too bad for a nice chilly, well, it's not too bad, day in Wisconsin. You being in Washington, that's kind of a, uh, uh, it's really warm there, right? Uh, well, it's, it's relative. I'm like, oh, it's terrible. It's cold out there. It's 45 degrees and raining. Yeah, that would, that was... uh, probably not Wisconsin cold though. It's... <laughs> yeah, well, I had to wear a light jacket this morning. So, oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I got a little bit wet. Walking your, down. your book is, 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 is science fiction. And when we, uh, when we look at the book blurb, it talks about AI and, and sentient beings that are or a sentient AI that's, uh, that's kind of controlling humanity. So jump into it. Tell us about it, man. Yeah. So uh, as you said, the book's called Systemic. Uh, and and it, this, this AI you're talking about, we call it uh, the system, which is really cheesy and weird. Uh, just to, oh, there's an AI called the system, but actually the, it's called the system because uh, the people who were developing it never named it. They just said, oh, we're working on this system. And eventually the AI gets out into the world and it establishes a, uh, you know, a Facebook account. It's not really Facebook, but a Facebook account. And it's like, you need a name. And he's like, well, I've always been called the system. So that's where the system comes from. So it's kind of cheesy and kind of bad, but it has a backstory. Uh, so at any rate, uh, what the system does, one, one of the first things that the system does is it starts teasing apart fact from fiction. Um, just people said, hey, I've, I've heard this thing. It sets up, everyone knows it's, it's an AI. It doesn't try to hide that fact. It's not sneaky. It's not evil or mean. Uh, but it's out there. It's like, hey, I'm an AI. And you know, the way people do when an AI shows up, they start trying to confuse it and tease it and do what they do. Um, and it's very sincere and it, it cares and it tries and, uh, and it's, it's trying to answer their questions and take care of them the way that you would hope it would. Um, and then someone finally says, Hey, I heard this news story and I don't know if it's true. And the AI is like, I can handle that. And it goes and figures this out. And that kind of starts this, uh, chain reaction where people are like, Oh, this system, uh, can actually be used to, uh, parse out reality from, from fake news or real conspiracies from fake conspiracies or conspiracy theories and and so it gets kind of uh, a reputation as being a nonpartisan arbiter of truth and so the term systemic actually means it is of the system it is it is valid by the validated by the system so systemic actually means truthfulness um, which is the name of the book so it's all about truth and reality and that's what the book actually stands for which is fun uh because uh right when i released my book uh other systemic things in society were trending um and so whenever i'd say hey i wrote a book called systemic hashtag systemic most of the tweets weren't really about my book as it turned out there was a lot of other systemic problems in society that were kind of getting mixed in with my book i got a bit lost in the noise so that's kind of the background of the story is that uh, there's this AI and over time people start asking it to develop policies about everything from, you know, social justice things to environmental stuff to, uh, you know, population control, whatever, 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 any problem that the hum humanity has that we've been sort of giving to this system to solve for us. And of course, as we do that, uh, our agency in the world lessens over time to the point where, uh, you know, our jobs are being done by the system, our, our politics are being run by the system, everything is being run by the system, which sounds horrific, it's dystopian, but the weirder part about it is it's not that bad. Actually, the system is fundamentally, programmatically a good thing. Everything that it does, it takes into account what, what is good for humanity and the world. And so it has this fundamental a governing assert within it to make sure it doesn't do anything horrible and bad and blow up the world and turn us into robots and batteries, right? So we took care of that. There's but a the movie about that. <clears throat> yeah, I know there's lots of, there's a lot of movies about that. There's this, this thing where it's like, AIs are horrible. And so when I wrote the book and I, I, I was like, what happens if the AI isn't horrible? Turns out people really suck anyway. <laughs> so it's not the AI's fault. And so the AI is really just this kind of background for humans to be humans. And, um, and, and the question that the book is asking is, what if we solved all the problems? Would humanity suddenly be happier? And the answer is no, actually. And so a lot of the book is about just 
people not knowing what to do with themselves when they don't have problems to solve. They, they're not making their art anymore. They're not making books. They're not doing anything because the system just does everything for us. And so that's kind of the background of the book. Um, it's not really what the book is about. It's just that's, that's the world that we live in. And so start there um, and you've got three main characters. There's a gentleman named Mike um, who, who lives in a population center in a city. And he's fallen madly in love with this, this woman who, who he met, who came through town. And, and he's like, I want to go follow her. She's just coming through town and she's going someplace and he's poor and he doesn't have any money. So he spends the next year saving up money to, so he can go follow uh, this, this woman to the, this small town where she's moving. That's one of our stories. There's another uh, gentleman named Lem and Lem is my, perpetual downward spiral, my bad decision maker, not a bad guy, but he makes bad choices. And he and his wife have separated for various reasons. And he's very upset at the system for the rules and things that set in place that made this happen. I won't necessarily get into what those yeah. are. Um, and so he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to go get that system. I'm going to go. <laughs> and it turns out that the system is hosted in this small town called Prower, where the, the woman has gone to. And then there is uh, Aaron, who is a young lady who's going home to her hometown of Prower. Um, and she's hiking, hiking through the sage lens. It's up in the uh, Western, well, to you it's Western, to me it's Eastern desert, kind of in the, mm -hmm. the Western desert of the United States kind of area, um, sage lens kind of stuff. And she's hiking home to go surprise her mother with a surprise visit. Um, and they're, so they're all converging on this small town in the middle of nowhere. And, and the question is, why are they doing that? Uh, what's that have to do with the, the, the system and the way that the society is running? And that's the setup for the book. And then things happen. Things happen. Stuff happens. Lots of things happen. Surprising things happen even. Um, wow. So, yeah. <clears throat> and I'd like to say hilarity ensues, but it's actually not very funny. It's just, there's like three jokes in the whole book. So, <laughs> so you know. I mean, just, I, I, I find that a lot of people, um, like my books are dark and they're like, oh my God, it was hilarious. And it's like, okay, uh, well, great. Glad, glad you <laughs> like my humor. <laughs> yeah, books are a bit of a Roshark test, right? So they kind of are. It, it, it's a reflection of, of who you are. So, I mean, what people find funny is sometimes just shocks me because, you know, when I was, when I'm writing it, I'm like, Okay, now he cocks his, you know, and you know, blows the guy off, you know. Basically. Yeah. Oh my God, that was hilarious the way he did that. You know, shoved him in the trunk and cut him up. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. That was that was meant to be shocking, but all right, all right, that's cool. Yeah. Funny, yeah. shocking, you know, gross. To, okay, whatever. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of my my female character in my book, Erin. In fact, she's pretty snarky and funny. Uh, but it's not, she just says some funny things. They're not really jokes, but she, that's kind of just her character. She's just kind of charming and funny. Um, but the thing I love more than people that find humor in my books are people that find meaning. And I love this because it's like, not that my book, I, you know, I write, and I'm like, oh, I will embed meaning in these things, my metaphors. But it's always funny when uh, somebody like finds something that you never oh. intended. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I meant that. You're, you, dang, I can't believe you picked up on that. You, you read you, you cracked the code. <laughs> yeah, you, you figured out. Uh, I uh, when it, there's a scene in my book. So the AIs, there's these sub AIs or whatever you call them. They're kind of like uh, you know Alexas or something like this. These little yeah. things in, uh, and and they kind of are just these glowing orbs that just kind of hover in the air and whatever. And and so that's just the shape that they take. Um, colorful little glowing orbs, or like holographic orbs. And, uh, and there's this one thing where a guy like lights a, a flint and steel and it makes this, you know, that thing that happens when you get a flash in front of you, you got this kind of gray thing. Yeah. And he's like, I really like how you took the, the, the primitive flint and steel and, and made it like into a gray version of the AI. Like it's a technology. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. I like that. I, I will definitely tell people I did that on purpose. So. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a meme going around at one point in time on Facebook that I I know I saved it but it was you know what did the writer mean when he said that the curtains were blue 
and it, then it says writer the damn curtains were blue <laughs> had nothing to do with feelings i want blue curtains because they went with the red walls yeah or something yeah. like that it's just like exactly yeah there's it or and then of course people totally miss the meanings of the things that you meant to to show in there so oh I, yeah I figured this out when I was in college and I had, uh, you know, friends that were art students or whatever. And, and uh, you would go to art galleries and they would, the, the, the best thing that the artist would often do is, you know, you ask people what they see in your work and let, right. let, them, let them tell you. And you're like, that is fascinating. And they always feel like they're brilliant, which is good. You want people to enjoy your work and, right. and it's kind of a conversation. So it's nice, but. <laughs> All right. I'm glad you picked that up. Yeah. You betcha. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a 20 year old daughter also who is a mm -hmm. art student in, in college. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when in class, she does all these happy, you know, she, you know, she does pottery, she does the you know, woodwork, she does the painting and the drawing, it's all happy and everything. <clears throat> when she is drawing just to practice and draw for herself, she's got a dark side to her that is and i mean it's dark gothic circus type stuff and it's just like whoa you know yeah. and i i so want her to do some art for me for my site and my books and stuff like that and i can't get her to do it but it's like yeah. it, this matches perfectly you know i could yeah. i could write an entire book around this drawing just you know no it's mine dad no it's like i'm still gonna do it i'm just gonna wait till you're a little older and i'm gonna steal yeah. it I, uh, my, you my daughter at my house when you move out. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, yeah. I, I know where you keep your stuff. My, my <laughs> daughter is a, an extremely, uh, gregarious and pre pretty happy go lucky person, but she's also a writer. She's actually a fantastic writer and she writes dark stuff. Like it's like, mm -hmm. I watch the stuff she writes. I'm like, man, not only is that probably better than what I write, especially for a 13 year old, but it's, it's pretty dark. She was, I remember she started writing songs and, and stuff when she was probably seven or eight that were just like seriously dark stuff. And it's like, huh. And like I said, she's just very happy, go lucky running around. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, but I'm going to write a song about a village on fire and, <laughs> and mothers screaming and looking for their children. I'm like, that's pretty dark for a nine-year-old, honey. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I never tell her not to. I'm like, you more power yeah. to you. You describe that sense of horror quite well for a nine-year-old. So. You can't snuff that creativity, but on the other hand, you kind of wonder where it comes. So it, just kind of curious, um, uh, your wife, does she go, oh, all right, Chris, <clears throat> that totally came from you. Now stop it. I, I made her watch Barney. What did you do? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my 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 wife uh, is we 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 all find the the kid pretty charming. Uh, but you know, my wife now you would never know it. She's she's a uh, you know she stays at home. She's a stay at home mom, and she volunteers at the school, and she does a lot of sewing and things like this. But uh, when she was younger, she had you know the purple mohawk and was full on golf, <laughs> and so she's kind of like, oh, she's so dark. Oh, it's wonderful. So see, it's, it's great. And, but I, I did start her off on Lord of the Rings pretty early. And, uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of the, the cities burning and the, where's my baby thing may have come from the Hobbit. And when, yeah. you know, smog burns down the, I, I think that was a very impactful moment on her was smog. And now she's totally into dragons, which is what 13 year old girls do they're either gonna know, hopefully she gets over the whole dragon thing because you know those dragon authors are weird yeah yeah i i i, I think it's great she she writes sort of <laughs> like that. but yeah i'm like you know you i've got, got a, a i've got a couple of friends who are dragon write dragons and so that's just a bunch <laughs> of them so if they ever listen to yeah. this i'll know <laughs> yeah. hey hey i heard you on the, i i i am i'm an open uh I, I like most writing, kind of like movies. Like I'll watch just about any movie. I like them all. But if you start doing the same thing over and over again, like I can only watch so many zombie movies. I can like, yeah, I get it. The one day want to eat you and they run around. It's like every once in a while you go, oh, fast zombies. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like that's a, an, an expansion of it. But there's only so many zombie movies I can watch. Um, and so many dragon books I can have. My, oh, my right now is just drawing dragon all the day. The time. Walking Dead, mm -hmm. Yeah, it has nine seasons. And I, I'd never watched it before just because uh, same way. It's like, eh, 
another zombie movie. No yeah. And I watched the first three seasons during this wonderful COVID lockdown. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, this is pretty good. You know, and they're short. So, I mean, you know, do an hour a day, blah, 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 whatever. And by the time I think I got to season seven or season six or seven, I'm just like, oh, my God. It's it's like a marathon. It's like halfway through a marathon. It's like I gotta finish, but I don't know if I can. Yeah. You know? the, the the once the baseball bat came out, uh, I don't know if you know if I don't even know what yep. season it is. Glenn and the baseball bat. I'm like, it's off. Yeah. No, I watched I watched through that just because I like him as an actor. Yeah, me too. Which is why I didn't really want to see him get his brains bashed out. I'm like, man, eh, I never watched that. And I was like, you know, I'm guessing what's going to happen after this is there's going to be zombies. They're going to think they're in a safe place, but it won't be as safe as they think. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and they're going to go off in these little side things. And so, which doesn't knock that up that series. I, I thought that series was fantastic. It was. And- it was fantastic and then to me it just kind of okay it's the same thing and then with with season eight i think they i think it was season eight they stepped it up oh, and really? there's a new concept in there and i haven't watched the uh, the latest season i think that's season nine maybe that's season 10 i don't know whatever it is but uh um they came at uh, they came at it with a different angle that i didn't see coming and i'm like holy cow okay and so i was instantly re uh, re-energized to watch it and and yeah. i know the the uh, current season's running now i think or maybe just finished up whatever it is and whenever that gets uh, loaded up into streaming i shall watch that too but yeah i think the thing that i learned from the walking dead uh that i think is really great is the walking dead isn't really about zombies and same way no. you know i mentioned I don't know if I mentioned while we were being interviewed, but about the book, like my book isn't really about AI. It's just kind of like the backdrop things. Yep. And, and the, the zombie thing in that, in that show in particular, and Night of the Living Dead, the first one, is just kind of like this, this thing that's this, this, this threat that's out there that kind of helps move the, move the plot along. But really it's about, it's about relationships and people and characters. And it, it's so heavily character driven that, that that's what makes it so good it's not yeah. you, you can only have zombies for so long before it's like okay it's zombies but it could have been a snowstorm that went for you know many well, many many it would work too it's, you know it's, and maybe i'm totally wrong on this but <clears throat> and but one thing i picked up was you know when you hear the walking dead you're thinking that they're talking about the zombies yeah and they're not you think the walking dead refers to the people yeah yeah you know, because the, the virus is in them, and when they die, they turn into a zombie automatically, even if they aren't bit because everybody's infected. Yeah. And then well, that's when they said, well, we're the walking dead. Yeah. Or it's like, <laughs> did they actually say that in the show some point? Yeah. Yeah, they probably did. But it's like the walking dead and the dead men walking, because it's really what that is, is the dead man really walking. Is. Yeah, it's like, well, you know but uh you know completely cool so what you know i mean we, we talk about horror what what kind of sci-fi do you watch oh um let me see sci-fi do i watch um so and, watch and why it. yeah well, no. <laughs> <laughs> and why? because it's cool because there's laser beams why uh, why no, I'm just i mean so so watching so the 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 watching of sci-fi i don't do a lot around the house and the reason is is you know just the structure of our lives, I uh, wind up watching about an hour of TV a day. And I watch mm-hmm. it with my wife. And my wife is pretty much over sci-fi. <laughs> and so we don't we don't get to watch much sci-fi TV. I love sci-fi movies. I love sci-fi books. Uh, you know, but I, I again, I, I like almost all movies. And I like almost all books that are, are well written. And so I'm, I, I would say that my, my diet of sci-fi media is you know probably 60 to 70 percent of my media is sci-fi but certainly not 100 percent and mm-hmm. uh, so um so as far as things that i i like in sci-fi what are some great um i'll tell you what my favorite sci-fi book is and ever and i think that that's ender's game i love that i love the i love the concepts of it i i loved how it was written i love the the twist that was in it now that that's kind of like an M Night Shyamalan moment, where you're like, oh, you can make a movie or a book that has such a massive twist in it that it totally changes the entire nature of the thing that came before it, and and so I, I love that book just because of the structure of it and the sci-fi and what it was all about. So that was fun. Mm-hmm. 
but I love things like Dune uh, is so good. I'm really looking forward to someday being able to watch that new Dune movie. Um, and, you know, Dune, Dune in particular is kind of sci-fi, but it's also sort of fantasy and it's sort of just this epic giant book that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I love Philip K. Dick things. And so, yeah, when I think about the sci-fi I really like from movies, like things that are that come out of Philip K. Dick novels are always pretty fun. So I loved, you know, the uh, I just saw an ad for Total Recall the other day. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a really cool movie. Like things, again, with weird twists. Blade Runner had some weird twists in it. That new Blade Runner movie. Oh, that was beautiful and awesome. Star Wars, all that stuff. I, I just like sci-fi and yeah, particular. Like, yeah, it's good. Cool. So you big into romance too, or just kidding? There are, all right. So I'm going to take, I'm going to back it up a little bit. It's kind of like, <laughs> I, I, say, I say things like, oh, I like all kinds of music. And you're like, what about this? And I'm like, eh. I did say music. on the Hallmark channel, are you? No, just no. So, so here's the things I hate. I do not like... <laughs> and, and by the way, I, 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 I don't want to debase romance. Like I'm a, I'm a... I don't either, but I, I, I end up doing it anyway, just because yeah. you know, they, they sell more books than the rest of us. And yeah, uh, those guys are jerks. They really they are jerks. They just sell like, you I'm know, not what jealous I at all. They're there. Yeah, no, there'll be a, a, a dark, handsome, muscular man who's silent and we'll go figure out how to get on his good side and get into the soft gooey center of him. And it'll be great. And there'll be lots of interesting sex. And I'm like, God, that sounds easy to write, but it probably isn't, and I would fail at it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so so screw you. That's not nice. No, uh, I don't. I, I I don't read those things. I also don't read mysteries, um, which is weird because I think I would like mysteries. But the thing that I I I can't get past on mysteries is that they feel very post hoc. Like someone said, you know what I'm going to write is a book where a guy uh, swallowed a knife on a train. And no one will know why. And I'm going to go back from there and make everything make sense to that. And so I always feel like they're, they have this weird structure to them that no one would under, no one would ever get that. And so, so I, I, I can't suspend my disbelief on mysteries, uh, which is sad. I think I would really enjoy them if I wasn't such a jerk. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think mysteries are my fault. I think the reason I don't like mysteries is because of me, not because of mysteries as a genre. Yeah. R ro romance, just, they probably make me feel weird. I'm like, you know. It probably touches something inside that I just don't want people to know about. Wow. So, so, okay. So I avoid that. No. All right. So what, how are you really feeling, man? Just kidding. Yeah. I mean, sure. it's, it's, been a, it's been a rough year. Um, no. Uh, it's, it has been a rough year, but that's not what I'm feeling. Uh, um, grab a tissue, will you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. So, um, yeah. And, and, and I really dislike anything that Merchant Ivory has ever put out from a movie. So pretty much... Uh, anything where you know and i got nothing against british accents i actually am quite fond of them but anytime there's somebody who is very very rich who's having very very bad troubles and their help and them are mismatched layers of society i'm like that's a great uh, story here once i uh, yeah uh, merchant ivory films we're going to go to florence and we're going to do this thing and it's going to be beautiful and I'm just, I, I can never, I just never feel sympathy for, for those characters. Yeah. 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 But, you know, they sell, but yeah. Just fine, like more power to them. People yep. say they like Merchant Ivory films. I had a wonderful girlfriend when I was young who loved Merchant Ivory films. And I'm like, you just go watch those. Uh -huh. I'm going to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm going to yeah. do my own Merchant Ivory thing down at the, uh, <laughs> The, the 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 merchant ivory is the bar down the puts pub down the street the merchant yeah, ivory right that's the merchant ivory i'm gonna do you bet <laughs> so now now i'm gonna stop hating you you've touched on all my my hating that i have oh no we gotta continue what else do you hate man uh, i don't know it's a lot of things that uh, oh you're shutting down on me okay yeah, that's all right i don't know i mean I, right um <laughs> no it, you know, you know what I, you know, there, there are many things that, that, that uh, boil my blood that I am so tired of thinking about and speaking about and arguing about that uh, I, if, if we were in the last five minutes of our interview, I'd be happy to get into them, but I don't want to make that the rest of my interview. Oh, and I, I kind of probably, kind, I kind of probably, you know, that's a, my favorite line in my book. Um, 
I, uh, I I can guess where that's going to go, but yeah, we yeah. can we can touch on that later. But yeah, um, we'll we'll touch on it later. I'm I'm happy. I, I should say I'm happy. I'm I'm chomping at the bit to 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 vomit forth a bunch of uh, you know frustrations and angers, and I just I don't really want to go there right now. <laughs> uh, happy to do it later. All right, fine. just a minute. Show <laughs> notes here. Vomit <laughs> and spew. Got yeah. it. I, I felt like I was doing so good being happy and friendly this morning. I don't want to do that yet. Um, yeah. I've been doom scrolling <laughs> an awful lot. Uh, just a lot of doom scrolling going on these days. In fact, I there's a so Twitter's cool, right? Like I like Twitter's neat. It's, it's I hate so Twitter. Sport. Ah man, I hate Twitter. I uh, I, I can't you know, do it. Yeah, I couldn't either. And so here's how I got into Twitter. So okay. I've had a Twitter account for. 10 years. I don't even know how long Twitter's been around. I've had a Twitter account that I literally used three times, <laughs> like I, like for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then when I, I wrote a book and uh, you've heard of it, Seth Stemmick, it's a book I wrote. It, it looks like this, by the way, I should show you this thing. That's what oh, the that's a really cool. Yeah. Isn't that a great cover? It oh, is a good book. cover. I, what? I, uh, I, it, it really makes me, uh, I, it, it really invokes uh, some curiosity. Yeah, I think, I think that's that's the feeling I get when I look at it. I'm looking at it like systemic. Okay, yeah, you know, it just it's kind of ominous and it's also kind of, you know, sci-fi. It you know almost almost has a, uh, you know, close encounters of the third kind type type of feel to it, along with you know kind of doom and gloom, along with, you know, I can completely see that in an AI type environment yeah it just it it's cool it hits me on different levels but yeah so you know, I, it's I, one of those things where you shake your head and, oh yeah that's well it's exactly going for but you know i was trying to look at them and see what they make me feel like and what they remind yeah. me of and it's it, you know it's just kind of cool yeah so there's a funny story behind that i hope my friend uh so i i have, I have a lot of friends okay a couple um and this thing i have a uh, my my good friend todd who's he's a graphic designer and he does all these things and one of my my very best friends um and he wanted to do the book cover after he read it and i'm like okay and he's a very 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 busy guy like he's running around doing all this stuff and so it was taking him a very very long time to get it done and he was like uh let's get some concepts written down and um and then it came time for me to release my 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 ebook and i'm like hey man i i, I need a cover he's like yeah i'll, I'll try to work on it and i'm like well i kind of want to release my book and soon i don't want i can't keep waiting so i wrote to my actually my ex-girlfriend who lives in portland uh my my friend carly and i said uh hey carly i know you've done some graphic design stuff for books could you do a book cover for me and she's like sure um i'll do that and i'm like okay and i threw some ideas at her and she's like okay and within like a day and a half she gave me three book covers that was one of them mm. and i'm like that's gorgeous like i just yeah. love I, like she gave me three that were all they were all great but this one like was was gorgeous and so eventually so i use that as my ebook cover and on the uh then finally my my friend todd uh freed up some time and he was able to do so so he took that 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 thing and he he, he redid all the the fonting on it to make it more cool and he did some really clever little things down here with the the a novel and all that and, and redid the spine and did the back and did all that and pulled it all together and so those two people made that book cover for me the thing that i think is so funny is carly just was like here how about this it's like she just kind of like wrote it on a napkin and threw it off at me one day and i'm like <laughs> that is the most beautiful book cover i've ever seen and you did it in like 20 minutes uh, it wasn't probably 20 minutes she probably spent all night working on it but uh, to me it felt like 20 minutes i was just impressed and and there's a lot that she put into that haphazardly that actually really really uh brings uh comes to the book like i'll show you one more thing and then we'll talk more about twitter but if you look here and i think that what this is is actually it's like a sundial or something or something yeah. that's found there's a bunch of schematics and stuff that are kind of cool but then there's this little nodule up here with a little orb and people since have said it's really cool how you put the ai orb up in the corner there like that and i'm like and that looks like what he's looking at and i'm like I bet Carly didn't do that on purpose, but yet again, another time where people are like, it's amazing how brilliant you guys are. And I'm like, it is amazing. And that we're not. It, and then you it, know, it, it's just something that comes naturally. I'm sorry. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. back to Twitter. The thing that was cool about Twitter um, that I've now appreciated in the last, like, I don't know, six months. Uh, and this is what, uh, you know, the, the genius of the president is that 
the the contact between somebody who's up here and somebody who's down here in that direct link is an amazing thing. So for instance, uh, one of the right when I released this book, I said, you know, I wrote this book and and uh, there it was inspired by blah blah blah. And one of the things I said was. Uh, and it was inspired by a book called uh, Station Eleven, which is by uh, Emily St. Vincent Mandel or St. John Mandel or whatever. I forget her actual full name, but she's just an author. And there's some some aspects of her work of Station Eleven that made it into this, special, specifically some of the scenery and stuff. And I, you know, I did an ad, and, and this famous writer like liked me. I'm like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. cool. <laughs> and then like yesterday, I wrote. Uh, I said I had a rough day yesterday, as we all kind of did. And I said, wow, I literally wrote 15 words today. And I feel like it was an accomplishment. And this other author who I followed, like said, oh, that's cool. And like, I'm like, it's very interesting to see this connection between mm -hmm. the, the unwashed masses, me, and, and these, these sort of people that you, you think are sort of luminaries. And there's one of my guys uh, that I started reading, uh, uh, Gareth L. Powell. I started following him on Twitter. He's a wonderful guy, like a bunch of, a bunch of these authors I started following just to kind of see how they do their multi, how they do their, their uh, media. And it's very humanizing. And so Twitter can be horrible. Facebook can be horrible, but there is this, this connectivity thing that happens that if used for good is pretty fantastic. And pretty <laughs> you know, it's for good. Yeah. Well, anything can be used. It's the, my, my AIs in my book, like they can be good. They can be good too. They don't always have to be bad, but it's a double-edged sword. All tools mm -hmm. are double-edged, right? And so Twitter does have these amazing properties that uh, are, are have surprised me over the last six or seven months. So that's it all. It does. My, my issue is that um, there's so much, yeah. there's so much stuff going on, you know, yeah. and it's hard to, you know, and it's it's not any different with any of the other social media, but Twitter I find especially hard to keep track of people. Yeah, you know, there's, and I there's... think that you don't honestly like. There's this thing that this thing that happens because we use things that are like these instantaneous micro blogging things at work and chat things and whatever you know, uh, Microsoft Teams or or Slack or things like that, and and there there there's an effervescent quality to those things where it's like you you things that you need immortalized, you write down in documents or you publish into books and things that are effervescent, you can put them into these micro blogging things. It's like, hey, I need somebody to help with this thing. Like you, that doesn't need to be around forever. And there's so many right. things like that, that if you've got a thousand people watching and two of them see it, cool, you're done. Like you don't need it to stick around. And so it's not really for keeping track of people. It's like, did you ever read, uh, like, study like, I, media theory and, like, Marshall McLuhan or anything like that when you're, like, well, yeah. message stuff? Just to refer back, I, sh I should rephrase that. It's not people that I want to keep track of. It's more along the lines of people that really enter – their tweets are really entertaining. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'd like to see them in my feed versus, versus, you know, oh, shoot, I haven't seen anything from Cat Rambo in a while. You know, yeah. and then going and finding her and having to go through her tweets to, you know, see what she's, uh, you know, popped out now. Yeah, you know, or something like that. So I mean, it's it just to me, it just becomes a little more irritating. But yeah, yeah, it's the format of it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I I, I get that. And but then again, you run across people that are just spewing off crap that you know hashtag this right, and it's like, oh, that's hilarious, and then you follow them, and you know, they follow you back, like you said, or you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, so it, it's it, it it's horrible, except that it's cool, you know. So. But for the longest time, I thought Twitter was just horrible, like just horrible. I, 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 there's, there's some serious problems with, uh, and I think that maybe we'll evolve out of it or we'll destroy ourselves, one of the two. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's going to go one of those two ways. There's no middle um, ground there. I, I, honestly, there probably isn't when it comes to things like, like this. But, um, you know, right now it's just, there, it's just such a wild west and there's such a fire hose of, of information good or bad it's just like you know little bits of information flying at you it, it can be a bit much to manage um and so eventually we'll figure out how to manage those things better and or we won't and it's just going to be well this thin thin <clears throat> muck this muck of information which is at now is just going to get worse that's one of those two right so so you and i you know i mean 
kind of being involved in the corporate world, you know, those are things that you want to manage on your email servers and on your, you know, corporate discussions and everything else. But when you're talking about social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, um, and Twitter, um, do you really want to control that? I mean, even well, if it's a really bad idea or really if it's a really asinine idea or comment or whatever, the fact that it's able to be put out, isn't that just part of like, I mean, it, it's kind of part of free speech, kind of oh, and kind yeah. of not. But on the other hand, it, it I, I, I like that kind of stuff from the aspect that you can see who the assholes are and you can see who the good guys are. Well, I don't necessarily mean uh, controlling the people's ability to write and post. What I more mean by controlling is, and, and there's some nuance in there, but the 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 thing that I, I more am talking about is there there used to be, for better or for worse, it's just a fact, whether it's good or bad, I won't say, but there used to be this sort of hierarchical transfer of knowledge uh, in, in, in the world. So, you know, whether it was a, a government thing or a church thing or a or, you know, publication thing where there was like this, this built in sort of filter that that happened. And we got rid of that for better or for worse, we did. And now it's just this sort of flat non hierarchical transmission of information point to point, as I was saying earlier, which is really cool, like me and, uh, you know, an author can talk, I, I met a guy who made a movie I liked, and I sent him my book, because he and I were talking on Twitter, like, that's pretty cool. It's like this that point cool. to point transfer of information and knowledge. And that's, that, that is not inherently good or bad. It just is. And that's been democratized around so much that there's just this flat level field of information. And I don't necessarily say that that's bad, but I, as a human being need to control that. I need to say that is important. That is not important. That is something that I don't know about, but should, which is something our, our media does not do well today, which is there are things out there, our media does not, our algorithms don't quest for us. They right. don't do anything that pulls in additional information. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're set up to uh, regurgitate and feedback information consistently over time so that you get things that, you know, you get your dopamine response and those types of things. Right. And so, so what I more mean is we, everybody, need to figure out ways of curating the data that comes to us in ways that is useful and meaningful and doesn't just lead to doom scrolling all the time. And so that doesn't need to be the companies that do that. We need to come up with some way of managing that amount of data that's coming at us. The interesting thing about right now, and you know, you've you've been a part of this with your uh, with with your career, definitely, is the amount of information that's available. Is I I don't know a time when you could just sit down and just look up something and research it, and research it and research it and find more information than you can possibly consume. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting from that aspect, but it's also interesting on how many people out there, I mean, you really have to watch what you're, what you're researching and make sure that's a notable source. You know, it's, it's a reliable source because there's a lot of crap out there too that just, yeah. you know. <laughs> you should read my book because that's part of my book. Yeah, uh, um, well, like what's yeah. crap and what's not, you know, you got to figure, you got to figure it out. And uh, like I said, there was this, I think it was MIT the other day in this article where they were saying, we have found ways of algorithmically detecting what is a conspiracy theory versus, you know, information about an actual conspiracy. We can tease those things apart now programmatically, uh, I'm sure using machine learning algorithms, but um, you're right. And, you know, I always think about this and I should, I, I probably, this is a novel idea probably, but I, I think about what every technology that we develop as humans changes us. Like that's kind of who we are. We're, we're humans. We have these technologies and, and the internet in a very real way has, has kind of offloaded a lot of the things that we need to do as humans, which is a theme of my book as well. Like memory thinking, like all these yeah. sorts of things, like, we offloaded that. It's like we have this other machine that does that in the same way that our toaster makes our toast hot for us instead of us having to, I don't know, stick it in our armpit or whatever, warm it up. It's like 
this thing out there like i does don't this thing know how it works out there but uh, i've yeah. never made toast on an armpit so yeah well you should try it it gives a nice nice cheesy flavor to it um, <laughs> but but you know so there's this whole thing out there that does this thing that we used to do uh wayfinding like we used to know how to wayfind and now we have you know google maps and stuff and and, and right. gps systems so we're offloading our key no, we have microsoft maps we don't have yeah big big maps <laughs> big, big maps i'm sorry yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're not you don't even get the brand right that's how bad that is um <laughs> but you're like offloading these things and and like so one of the other things we're offloading is mistakes you know we make mental mistakes all the time we have that's also part of my book. I guess it's kind of something I obsess about. Our brains make mistakes. We have logical errors. We have all these things that our brains, frankly, do poorly. Remember things. Mm -hmm. We're not good at that. And so we've taken sort of the, the neural capacities and, and things in our brain. We've offloaded into the system. We're like, whoa, there's a lot of crazy ass misinformation stuff. It's like, that's because we took that human part of us that's dumb and makes a lot of mistakes. And we made it into a computer. <laughs> that everybody can see so now everybody can see how stupid our brains are yeah. and and so it's it's kind of in a way it's like this this deep uh revelation of human psychology that's just laid bare for everybody to see because that's where the processing happens now and where our memory is you know and it's kind of it's kind of off topic but kind of on the same thing uh same path that you're going on the one thing that i really love and i hate to see it when it gets shut down or when people start you know really dissonant is I love the flat earthers. You love them? I do. Tell me why. Because they come up with some of the most creative responses to, you know, I, I just, I love conspiracy theories and I love to watch them argue. I don't, I don't really participate in their, in their things, but I'll hunt them out and I'll, you know, whatever they post. And then, you know, somebody comes in and says, well, you know, we've, we've actually had pictures of the earth and guess what? This is what it is. Well, that was through a fisheye lens and da, 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 da. And then they'll come into all this, this stuff. And it's so intricate. I just, I, I, you know, I kind of read it like a fantasy book. Yeah. 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 And it, it's just like, okay, so how did you come up with this? And then, you know, they'll go through methodologies of, of uh, their scientific yeah. process that just, it's it's uh, it's interesting, I guess, to me. Um, you know, it's kind of the same thing as watching uh, or uh, watching or listening to like real murder stories on how they, you know, uh, mm -hmm. some, you know, and the ones where the people actually got away and how did they get away with it, you know, that type yeah. of stuff. And and you know that that's interest interesting to me as a writer, just because it's like, oh my gosh, how'd they come up with that? That's that's an interesting way to think. Or yeah. Yeah, I mean, just all sorts of, and we can go into all sorts of dark things that I, that, uh, that we look up on the, uh, you know, interweb, but um, that's one of the things where I just, I, I look at it and it's like, it's so bizarre, but it kind of draws me in. It's kind of like the National Enquirer in, in the, uh, you know, shopping uh, line at the grocery store. It's just like, oh, really? Yep. <laughs> that's not even a picture of him, but yeah, okay. <laughs> He's an alien. Got it. He's a crocodile man. Got it. Yeah. You know? I, I think so that's fascinating to me too conspiracy theories I, I find aggravating uh because they're so incredibly illogical but and yet I find them fascinating uh be, because of this and this is again something that I obsess about and think about all the time and it makes its way into my book uh as well and and some of the other like short stories that I've written uh, is that that sort of how does this how does this work and how does this happen and, and one of the fundamental things about human psychology, as I understand it, is we have emotions. Like we have this emotional, deep-seated feeling about something. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and with conspiracy theorists, a lot of it, and I shouldn't just say them, everybody, we have these sorts of things where it's like, I feel that something is wrong. I feel that that person is bad. I feel like that system is bad um, or whatever those things are. Uh, or I feel like, I feel like there's things in the world I don't know and I don't understand and it makes me anxious and angry because there's somebody who knows something and they're not telling me. I feel like I'm, right. I'm being kept in the dark. So you have this feeling. And then after that feeling, and people don't know they do this, but they do, all the other stuff, the feeling is what it's about. 
and everything else is just sort of post hoc justifications of why you feel that way and why feeling that way is the correct way to feel. And that's not a conspiracy theorist thing. That's just how people are. That's how our brains are. And so conspiracy theorists have something that they believe fundamentally because it's an emotional belief. And like flat earthers make perfect sense. They do, which is I, I feel like I understand the way the world works and I have my eyes and I look and the earth is flat. Look, and they say this, you talk to them like, use your eyes, the world is flat. And you're like, no, it's, it, it looks that way. Like, like they, they, can't, they can't tease out that perception. And anybody who tells you it's not flat has to be part of some system. They have the technology, they have the money, they have whatever to prove mm -hmm. that the world is round. And it's like, or, or they have math, which by the way is the most democratizing thing in the world is math. And they have that too, but sure, not everyone can have a space shuttle. And when they do try to make their own space shuttle, it doesn't work out so good. No, it, yeah. Um, but, but that's what, it's really about that emotional feeling of the, the, this whole system in society telling you that you cannot trust your own senses. And, and, and science just gets weirder and weirder. Like there's quantum stuff where things are waves and they're particles at the same time. And they're, they're entangled over kilometers and you can do, and it's like, it's just crazy. And so I think people when faced with that have this reaction of my eyes tell me truth my senses tell me truth and all this other stuff is, is eggheaded bullshit. And they, they feel that. And then everything else is just po post hoc reasoning about that and, and why that's the right way to feel. And so that it makes sense that, and I think all conspiracy theories are like that. The power structure is bad. The, uh, this person's nasty. The world is flat. Like, it's just, I have a feeling and I need to make that feeling make sense to me in the world. Mm -hmm. And don't, I, I... <clears throat> I, I, I really enjoy, um, like I said, the arguments and then, you know, then it usually a flat earther is usually going to refer to the Bible and how it's described in the Bible. Um, you know, there's some sort of a fish dome over top of us, you know, what you see out there in stars is not really stars, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And like I said, I, I, I really enjoy the arguments that they get into with people. And then yeah. I also enjoy the people that, that agree with them and, and bring in their own, you know, uh, research. <clears throat> as long as we're talking about that, this other thing, you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it just, it, it just, it gets really kind of bizarre. There's sometimes when I, when I'll read them and be like, okay, I don't have an answer to that, but it's good that I don't have an answer for why that happens, but I can look it up and, and see, but you know, I'm just, it's not something that's in my memory bank. So uh, I'll take a look at that. And it usually furthers my own personal knowledge, just trying to debunk. Okay. I, I can't explain yeah. that, you know, I, and as far as all the math equations and, and geometry and everything else that they threw out at it, you know, it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, an adage that I grew up with in the corporate world is that numbers don't lie, but you can yeah. lie with numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, the, the thing that is very frustrating. So I think all of, all of us is, and including conspiracy theorists, by the way, like it's gotta be frustrating to them too, is you can't convince anybody of anything at all. Like you can't convince a, a flat earther that the earth is round. They, there's no way in hell looking at the other way that they're going to convince me that it's not. Right. right. And so it's, and they're like, and, and both of us on both sides are like, but, but, but can't you see, can't you understand? It's like, there's no, there's no transfer of knowledge. There's no transfer of ideas. But I will say this about conspiracy theories that, that gives me a, a, a sideline hope, not about conspiracy theories. Those are always going to be there, but the amount of creativity that goes into them. Oh yeah. Indicative of the fact that humans are wildly creative. Like mm -hmm. you always need to take that and, and, and make it about, I don't know, cool architecture or storytelling or something that isn't actively destroying society. You know, that would be cool because you're very yeah. creative, obviously. So, and hardworking, they work hard at it. One of my favorite ones that I really, I, I really can't find any research on and I really, I, I can't discount it is the moon. It's there. Okay. It's there, but <clears throat> Here, here's the theory. We went to the moon. Mm -hmm. Once we found out it wasn't made out of cheese, we never went back. <laughs> I just, okay, cool. Yeah, it's just a big damn rock. Okay, we're going someplace else.
Well, I mean, that's not in entirely inaccurate i mean we went up there <laughs> at time. like it wasn't was like funny as hell like, the, the, the things that i would say is no one ever actually thought it was made of cheese that was just something that we thought was funny in a uh, in a movie in the 20s so nobody really thought it was made of cheese but we did go there and went hey it's a big rock we'll send up another couple people yep still a rock and we're like yep. we beat the soviets and we're done like it was kind of yeah. like and but we're going to go back like it eventually, but there's not a hell of a lot on the moon. It's pretty barren. What I think is really funny. And, and I, I know part of it's true and part of it's probably, you know, uh, another conspiracy theory is that, you know, it, it, we got to the moon so quickly in that race and it was a, you know, it's a huge deal. It was a huge undertaking. And Absolutely. so there's lots of, of uh, issues and, and, you know, we've had, you know, we had failures and, and all sorts of stuff, but we got there and mm -hmm. we got there a couple of times and, you know, now it's, it's, you know, <clears throat> decades later. And I think it was, un gosh, what was it like uh, six, uh, six, eight years ago or whatever. And NASA said, we really don't have the technology anymore to really go to the moon and land like we did. Mm -hmm. And they had lost some of the data that they, they had, you know, had from in this, you know, when they actually did the lunar landing and it was just like, yeah, we, you know, it's like, well, we never, we went there and then we not, nah, we're not going back. So, you know, just throw the stuff in the archives and, you know, stuff gets destroyed and everything else. And it just really amazed me all the advances in technology we have. And it's really hard for us to go back to the moon. So the amount of, uh, it, it just, it, it makes the moon landing that more astounding. Yeah. And, it, you know, there are a couple of things that are fascinating about that. Uh, one is, you know, it's been said often that, you know, the thing I have in my back pocket telling me that I'm going to be late for a meeting in a couple of minutes, not a couple of minutes, but uh, is far more powerful than all the computational power that we had when we went to the moon. Like, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Like, that's kind of cool. Um so, so there's that. Uh, but then when, when people say we don't have the technology anymore, what I, I would imagine they mean is, you know, the, the, the systems that were built around the moon landing were based on horn rim glasses and slide rules. That is not how we do things anymore. And so it's right. not like there's some interface between all the moon technology that we had and how we do things today. We would need to rebuild that infrastructure to work with what we have today. And, and physically, the, the hardware, I, so I had a guy who worked for me many, many years ago, uh, and he was right out of college, and, uh, and he, his job as an intern, I was like, hey, you know, I was interviewing him, like, what did you do for your internship? He's like, well, I worked down at NASA, and I reverse engineered the, the, the rover. So they had a rover, cool. yeah. and he's like, we don't know how this works anymore go figure out how to turn that thing back on. And that was what his internship was because all the weird electronics and stuff that oh, were there, sure. like it's, they're, it's solid state stuff. Like it's weird, wacky stuff. And so he had to go with a voltmeter and figure it all out and turn it on. Cause it was like in a suitcase or whatever. He had to unpack it and build a moon lander like from scratch right? or not from scratch, but from the kit. Right. So right. it was like, cause no one's done that in 50, 60 years. And so he went and did it. Yeah, that's really um, cool. And so, yeah, it, it is, it is neat, but, but the hardware atrophies, like you can't take a Saturn V rocket from the sixties and just go turn it on. Like, no, right. It's like, that's not how that works. So I don't know. Well, you know, like, like breadboard, um, you know what that is, right? I mean, it's uh, no, okay. So when you, when you open up a computer and you have the motherboard and you uh, have, you know, and then you have the breadboard, which is just layers of copper and in a, in a coating. And then, you know, they drill leads down and put capacitors and, and resistors mm -hmm. and everything else. And that's how they, you know, make the electronics a portion of it where you seat the processor and that, you know, makes, makes the computer. So it's just breadboard. Um, you know, that deteriorates over, you know, 10 years. It's pretty brittle, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, taking something that's 60 years old, that's got, you know, it, it's soldered together. It's old time capacitors and resistors. And, you know, it works on, you know, either electronic or manual switches or whatever. I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't just be like, oh, cool. And you have to probably rebuild some of it just well, because, I mean, it, it just deteriorates. I've got my tube amp out in the garage from when I was in the band. That thing doesn't work anymore. It's only been 10 years. Yeah. 
you know. Take so, an yeah. old CR, you know, an old, uh, you know, tubed monitor, you know, and, and take that apart, you know. Or, or hook it up to your, you know, your your USB device. Oh, you, you can't hook it up to a USB device? Oh, because they didn't have USB back then? Yeah, it's kind of hard to hook it to a computer. Yeah. I got to go out and find like a, you know, Windows XP, you know, desktop computer or something to make it all work. Like that stuff, I don't think people appreciate the degree to which technology atrophies and how rapidly it does. Oh, no kidding. Because they're like, technology is moving so fast. It's like, I can't keep up with it. Why is it that the stuff from the 60s doesn't work anymore? It's like, <laughs> that first thing you said and the second thing is the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing, yep. <laughs> yeah, in my in my new book that I'm writing that's the follow-up to Systemic, I I'll, guess I'll give a, no one's no one's going to. No one's listened to this far in, so shh, don't yeah, they all they all quit like ten minutes ago. As soon as we started talking about flat earthers, they're like, "Ah, I'm out of here." Screw it. Uh, <laughs> the, in, in the book, um, basically, this system crashes at the end of the at the end of the story that it's gone for. I won't get into why or how, but that's what happens. And so the next book is way into the future where they're finding it and trying to turn it back on. And it's oh, like, "Oh, cool! This is hard." <laughs> you know, it's like. How do you how do you turn it back on? I've got an electro, electrical engineer uh, friend of mine in Australia who I call every once in a while and have Zoom calls and say, okay, so we have a DC system and an AC thing. We hook this up and what blows up and how does it blow up and what problems do we have? And we got to go work through that. But it's like, yeah, it's trying to figure out a massive, you know, quantum computing AI system from 200 years ago when we had to reinvent electricity is a bit of a hard thing to figure out how to work. Yeah. So, becomes archaeology at that point as opposed to technology so absolutely yep. and, and that's very much like nowadays when you walk into an office and it's like oh you still you're still using that and you want to upgrade all your computers they don't even make that anymore nothing's compatible with it and you're the only person on earth that i know of that's using that okay mm -hmm. we'll try and uh, we'll we'll do something with it <clears throat> you know there's a door that needs to be held open. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't deal with hardware. You're an IT guy. You deal with a lot of hardware. I deal with software a lot. And I have my, my the majority of my career, though I didn't intend this, has been migrating systems. Mm -hmm. So we have this old system that's falling over because it's really old. It's like five years old. And uh, it's falling over. We can't do it. So we need to move it to this new system and dot, 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 and making all this stuff happen. Like, it's what I'm doing at work now. It's what I did at eBay. It's what I did at Expedia. It's like always migrating systems. And so, yeah, just things, the 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 amount of entropy in a system and and how long it takes one of those things to become obsolete is, is a decade if you're lucky. Like, See, I'm, I'm kind of a snowballer yeah. is, is the only way I can really um, um, describe my consulting. So what happens is somebody calls up with a problem and sometimes it's just, you know, need a new computer. We need to update this. We need to fix this, you know, no big deal. And, but for the most part, um, I'll walk into something that somebody else has tried to fix and uh -huh. it's just not working. And they're like, okay, we need, we need to get somebody else in here. Okay. Yep. And you come in and look and it's, you know, you see all this, the, um, you see all the symptoms of what's going on. Okay. Well, this isn't working anymore and this isn't working anymore. Okay. And it's, yeah, well, okay. You have, you have different, you know, I, I've got people that are still trying to run windows XP. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, let's, let, we can't do that. Microsoft. Windows seven was really cool. Yeah. It's dead too. You know, and, but they have the software that, that they haven't upgraded, you know, and, um, I think my favorite one was that, well, my browser doesn't go on the internet anymore. And it's like, well, you can't upgrade this browser any longer because this operating system's dead and nobody makes, I mean, you have to upgrade to the next version, which requires, you know, actually three versions up, which requires this. And so when you start looking at, I need to upgrade this, and this is what you run your business on now. Um, you know, so we have to upgrade the servers and we have to upgrade the software because guess what? They don't have Windows NT4 anymore, you know, I'm, and I'm embellishing a little bit, but, you know, so then it, it becomes this, you know, what was just a simple problem. Now we got to upgrade servers. Now we got to put new switches in. Now we got to put new computers in. Now we got to take that software and migrate it to either the next version up or convert it to something else because that software company went out of business and it doesn't exist anymore. And it's this 
you know, what was, eh, it's, you know, it's, it's probably 200 bucks to get this fixed is all of a sudden a, you know, 60, $70,000 project. And it's, you know, it, I mean, it seems to happen once every, every two months or so, mm -hmm. somebody will call up and say, I just got this little problem. It's like, I, you know, my, my spidey sense goes, uh, -uh no nope. little problem. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, that 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 ability to 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 pick at that little thing that's sitting at the top and and have all the stuff underneath it. It's like that's it's a it's a great skill. I I also that is the story of my life as well. Again, yeah. from the software, it's app. like it's like Jenga. Yeah, I played Jenga over Christmas, and it's like here's my career. <laughs> okay, yeah. now let's rebuild it up. Yeah. It was gonna, we got to take this thing and, and move it all over. So yeah. I do this all day. Cool. This is just with blocks, but yeah, they, they pay me to do this. This is fantastic. <laughs> hey, we're hitting an hour. We're hitting an hour of, of talking right now. So um, now it comes to, Hey kids, it's time for vomit and spew. Oh, God. go. Come on. All right. <laughs> uh, so I didn't I, think I'd remember, did you? No, I, I, of course I, re I knew you'd remember, but I'm like, oh, you're not feeling well? You can go vomit, Stu. That's fine. I think the, <laughs> I forget about the phrasing. So, so I just read this really interesting book. I'll do this as the preface. And so I'm thinking a lot about this. It's a nonfiction book, uh, and it's called uh, I forget what it's called, but basically it's about moral psychology and how okay. all of us um, have like some fundamental. There, there's some fundamental building blocks of moral reaction and moral psychology. And so it's all about that. And, and so I preface that saying that I spend a lot of my time trying to understand people who don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do. I, I, I have sympathy for them. I have empathy for them. Even if I don't like the things that they do or, or whatever, I, I try very hard to, to, to understand them. And uh, it's gotten very, very, very difficult over the last year, especially, to to understand the amount of vitriol that exists in humans, in our country in particular, and the amount of what I consider to be willful ignorance that people uh, are willing to uh, engage in. And it does get back to the things about the flat earthers and they, they have this, this, this feeling and everything that they're doing is all this sort of intellectualizing and stuff to, to, to account for that deep seated feeling that over the last couple of days I realized is that there is a strain of people in this country who hate liberals more than they love their country. And they hate liberals more yeah. than humans. And they are so enraged by people like me, because I'm actually a fairly liberal person, that they're willing to do and say and feel and believe these things that are on the face of them insane and ridiculous. And, and to watch some of the things, especially in the last couple of days, that have, the fruit that those things have borne and how egregious it is and how anti- Pat everything those people claim that they stand for, love of country, patriotism, mm -hmm. America, democracy, all of those things that they, they say they care about, if th their inability to see the hypocrisy and the lie that they're living by doing the things that they're doing and the, the destruction that they're bringing to our country is just something that I... I just don't, I would like to say I don't have words for it, but I've got a lot of words for it. It's just, it's been appalling and not surprising. Like I, what, what happened the other day, I remember telling my friends a year ago, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. And when, when it came time for the election, I'm like, this is what's going to happen. In fact, our president said, this is what I'm going to do. He told everybody he was going to do what he did. And everyone's like, oh, this is blah, it's just Twitter. It's just, and I'm like, no, <laughs> you guys don't seem to get that this guy, whatever he is, doesn't bullshit about horrible things he's planning on doing. He, and that's and, the one thing you can say about him is he doesn't really, he doesn't really sugarcoat anything, nor does he, you know, I mean, at whatever, whatever thoughts going through uh, his head 
and it goes out into Twitter, it's usually, okay, that might happen, you know. Yeah, I mean. Somehow he may not do that. He may change his mind, but, it, you know, that's what he's thinking at the moment. It's like. <gasps> and, and, and I think that, you know, and, and people, I, I, I realize that a very large number of people in our society, including relatives that I now no longer can talk to, um, believe that. Uh, our election was stolen. And I, I, I know why they believe it. Again, it feels like it was stolen. If you live in a place where everybody you see loves this guy, and that guy has been telling you for years that elections in this country are bad and stolen, and anytime he doesn't win, it's a lie and it's a cheat. And you believe that. Like, So I get why those people storm the Capitol. They think that their world is under threat and that their democracy is under threat. But there's no there's no evidence. In fact, when you think about it, I mean, there's definitely some problems. There's always problems, but there's no, I, I see this meme going around where it's like, so you, you, you don't believe the voters. You don't believe 50 chiefs uh, uh, secretaries of state from all these different things, their government, their elections, their, the, the amount of coordination it would take to legitimately steal an election in this country, because we're not a federally run election system. It's not one dude with a button who can turn a knob. Even the voting systems, even if, even if those were fraudulent, which there's no evidence that they are, but if they were, there's many of them. So you would have to have many companies, many people, many, like the amount of conspiracy that would need to exist for that to happen is amazing. And then so you, and then they, they brought up evidence, which every court, including Republican appointed, like, all of these things, it's like, that's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And, and, and the, everything the one thing that really caught my attention that I'd love to see the documentation on at some yeah. point in time is the guy that claims that he uh, wirelessly got uh, hacked into the Dominion system. That bothers me. And the only reason it bothers me is because being an IT guy, it's like, wait a minute you can actually flip on a wireless system and just jump on it. Okay. Yeah. Investigate that. You, you should know. investigate. So, so don't get me wrong. In fact, but like everything else is kind of like uh, dead people. You, you can't do that enough. You can't, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that uh, you know, and the stupid shit that happened in, in uh, Pennsylvania um, or uh, um, uh, Philadelphia. Okay. <laughs> Yes, that's really stupid. They shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have stopped voting and done this and that. But I'm sure there's a reason for it or whatever, but it's still not going to swing things the way that you think it is. And when they go back and they count things, well, they didn't count, they didn't count them right. Wait, okay, how did they count them? You know, and then they went to court. And then some judge someplace. There isn't all just liberal and and you know, conservative judges. Even the Supreme Court said uh, you really don't have a whole lot of standing, so don't rely on us. And it's like, okay, those guys don't really give a crap what anybody else says. They come up with their own opinions regardless yeah. of what you think. You know, they're not you know, they I, it just it, and then it got out of hand. Well, it was intended to get out of hand is the thing that really upsets me. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a perpetuation of, of a lie and taking advantage of people who, again, they, they, we have post hoc explanations for our emotions and it's playing on the emotions of a stolen election. You say stolen election, people get really upset about it. But, but, you, but then we quickly, and this is the same thing with flat earthers and everyone else, prove a negative, prove that there wasn't voter fraud. It's, a, just, it's like a logically impossible thing mm -hmm. To, to prove a negative. You cannot do it. It is logically impossible. And it allows people that fact of information science. It's not like that's a conspiracy. You can't prove a negative. It's just the way knowledge works. It's like, it's a fundamental tenet of the universe. If you cannot prove a negative, it's like, which is why you have to prove people are guilty. You can't prove that they're not, that you can't prove that they're not, that they're innocent. You have to prove that they're guilty. And there, that's a reason for that. And so, so we have laws of evidence, we have these things, we have scientific proof, we have these things that, that help us control reality and given the fact that you cannot prove negatives, you have to prove positives. And then we have judicial systems that are based on that and we have laws and we have things and we have systems in place, we have these things. And, and, and all those things were like, nope, not real. And people are like, they're all corrupt, all of them. It's like, except for one guy and his lackeys. One guy with a Twitter account and his lackeys and, and your emotion, not your, but necessarily, but, and, and your emotions, my Twitter account and your emotions. And we can, 
we can have a, a, a coup d'etat attempt in the Capitol. Like that's all it takes. And it's like, that blows my mind. And I think it is, I think that our country will frankly never recover. I, I don't see how we'll ever recover from this here. You know, I'm not an expert on this, but I think that, uh, you know, when you, when you take the, uh, Mitch McConnell's and you take the Nancy Pelosi's and you get them the hell out of, out of the office and you put some actually, you know, respectable young people in there. And Mm -hmm. if they were actually crowdfunded, I, you know, um, you know, if they put term limits on Congress, I think that'd be really great. And if we got some of those old fogies in there that have developed this system of, of you know, basically Republicans versus Democrats, and we can actually have people actually work together for the common good of the Republic, I think that would be a turning point. But that's never going to happen we'll because they indoctrinate happen. people right away when they when they come into office, and it becomes this you know right versus left thing, and not da 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 da, and it's so sickening. I mean, if you go and watch C-SPAN, it's about the dumbest damn thing you ever watched, and you know, it just it, it's infuriating to watch these people uh, sit there watching my, uh, Mitch McConnell say no, we're not going to do more than six hundred dollars for everybody, you know, on that uh, uh, COVID relief bill. When you look at the bill, and it's got so much fluff in there for everybody. Mm-hmm. other than the American people. It's like, what the hell are you guys doing? So I understand the frustration. The government yeah. sucks. The government sucks. I get it. You know, the representative sucks. The whole thing sucks. I'm a libertarian. So I think everything sucks. Yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, and- but on the other hand, you're not going to storm the Capitol. I mean, what good does that do? That doesn't do any better. That's not any better than burning down Minneapolis, going to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and, and uh, you know, looting for no good reason. I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. And those thugs use these events to go ahead and, and just do whatever the hell they want to do. And it just, it, that pisses me off. I, I came to a conclusion, I said it earlier, uh, that the, the people right now, like the, the, the people who stormed the Capitol the other day, I, I, I've come to a conclusion. I've actually had some of them say this to me. I'll say things like, well, you know, that's not constitutional. And they're like, I never said I was a patriot. You know, I'm like, oh, they're not anymore. And so <laughs> I, realized, I, I realized that they, they, they want the brand of America. They like the flags. They like the colors. But they really, what they really want is a country called America that is their country. Like, that's what they want. And, and I'm like, I never thought that before. And, and now I do, it's like, cause, cause you don't, you don't, you don't want, you, you, you want basically in your opinion, a benevolent dictator, well, I don't think he's benevolent at all, but in your opinion, a benevolent dictator to rule over a country, which you would like to call America, which has the same flag and all that, but it doesn't have any of the democratic institutions. It doesn't have the rule of law. It doesn't have like all these things, like they're not Republicans. They're not, I don't even know that they're conservatives. They're just they're just people that that want a country that of their own called America. And, and, you know, I, it's funny, uh, you know, I'm a liberal. So we're all like, yeah, you know, country, I'm always kind of suspicious of patriotism and things like that. You know, we have that. It's like, I think I care more about my country now than I ever have in my entire life. And it's not because Donald Trump uh, arose some patriotism in me and waved the flag. It's like, I realize suddenly, and maybe too late, how important our country is and and how much of a threat he and his ilk are to it. And I never felt that way about anybody ever. I don't like Republican politics, but there's a lot of Republicans I love and respect, my family being some of them. And 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 so it's not about it's not about politics. It's it's not. It's about this weird cult that grew out of, and I tell my dad, who's a Republican, my mom, I'm like, I am so sorry. I'm sorry that this is what has happened to the, to the party that you identify with. And they, they didn't, they didn't vote for Donald Trump. They won't do it because they're, they're, they're conscientious Republicans. And they always have uh, been, you know, my whole life. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel terrible that their, that their ideology and the thing that they care so much about has been usurped in this way. And it just breaks my heart. The where I think things broke down is where is is when the two sides stopped talking. 
you know, yep. when I grew up, it was, you know, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan had a drink and there's a picture of it and they're laughing and, you know, just kind of what they disagreed, but they could actually sit down, you know, you know, at a bar and actually talk to each other. You know, it's not like they hated each other. It was an ideology, which they were more than willing to debate and, and, and vet out and figure out which way they wanted to go or whatever. And a compromise is a great deal. I, I love the fact that I've got both Republican and democratic friends that I can just talk to, and mm-hmm. we can talk about all sorts of things. You know, I'm kind of the third wheel on that, you know, cause I have, I have different appearance. There's some things I identify with on the liberal side and there's some things I identify with on the Republican side. And I think that's, Darian, that's how that, that works. That, that, oh, I think that's a better way of being than, you know, the people that identify with one party or another, and then all of a sudden, you know, automatically you have to hate the other side. Why? They just have a different way of thinking. You know, it's no different than you and I sitting in the office and we have a different, you know, idea of how a project should be laid out and how to do yeah. it. We would that simply... That contentious too, by the way. What's that? <laughs> and that gets contentious too, by the way. It does, but, but at the end of the really day in that work. setting, you know, you come up with, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. Okay. And you yeah. move forward. You know, yeah. I think that's what a lot of people can't do. And and I think that the uh, dramatic entries into this rioting and, and you know, how they portray themselves, I, I think hurts everybody. I think it just, it, it, you know, at one point in time, did violence become the way that uh, you made a point in America? I, I think it, you're, it's all very good points, but I, th- I think it did when people, and And I think this, by the way, is not a coincidence, me being conspiratorial for a moment. I think that this is an effort on someone's part. Not, I don't mean Trump. I just mean there's somebody doing this on purpose to us. Uh, And, and I think that it became, violence becomes the way that you solve problems when you, when you lose faith in your institutions, when you feel like your vote doesn't matter, when you feel like your representatives don't listen to you. And, and there are people in this world who are actively whispering in our ears via our very open social media channels we were talked to, your your government can't be trusted. When they say, yep, massive piles of, of, you know, evidence that that it's fine. Like we have people and anybody who says everything was not fine, but everyone's like, it all worked like it's supposed to. It's like, they're liars, they're traitors, they're cheats. Because there's somebody out there in the world who's saying America needs to be taken down a peg. And, and, and they are actively trying to make us to just, and that's what leads to violence. I always all, wonder it what it would feel like to be one of those people that were in charge of a, a polling station, mm-hmm. you know, and they get done, they work their ass off for like three days, counting everything and making sure that, you know, okay, this, you know, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and everything else. And then, you know, you show up on the news and it's like, these people are frauds. These people, you know, you wake up one day after yeah. working your butt off and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm on the news. Oh shit. I'm enemy number one in this. Oh, great. You yeah. Know. And it's not these people are frauds necessarily. They were literally saying these people are traitors and they should be hauled out in the street and executed. Yeah. For I heard that. Manning a polling station. And you're like, and, 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 and so I don't think that that's a coincidence that that's happening. Um, and, and I think that, I think that there's people internal or external to our country who are actively trying to do that. And, and, you know, I'm going to bring up a moment in time and I won't say who did it because I don't want it to be about politics, but it does get back to the way you were saying about Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. There was a moment in American politics when there was a, uh, a, a speaker of the house, I think, or, or somebody who was in, in leadership in Congress who told his constituents, do not move to Washington keep your homes and your families back in your districts and go back to and from Washington. And that moment in time was when the kids stopped playing little league together, when they stopped going to barbecues together, because on the weekends, when you would do those things, they went back to their homes. And that moment fractured the, the, the fabric of Washington, DC and all those sort of ways that the deals were being made. And it became an us versus them thing and the cross pollination totally stopped. Again, I don't think that was a mistake. It was it was quite purposeful. And American politics, being a two party system and a winner take all, we're not parliamentary. We you know we we have a winner take all system. Right. Like it that that system is set up that this is inevitable. And when you take away 
the guardrails that make it not inevitable, like barbecues and softball games, it, it, it just is exactly what's going to happen. When I took my honeymoon, I went to New Zealand with my wife and they have a parliamentary system. We happened to be in New Zealand uh, during elections. And I remember watching this debate. It was a, a televised debate, you know, uh, it was a very big thing. And there was, you know, not, it wasn't like Joe Biden versus Trump. It was like five people on a stage and they were all kind of like when you have our large debates. And there was the way over on the right was the really, really conservative guy. And the way over on the left was the really, really liberal lady. And they were arguing about policy, which was novel. Uh, they weren't just talking about, you know, how big their penises were, or whatever. <laughs> they, were, they were talking about policy. And I remember this, this thing that happened. So in a parliamentary government, and you know this, you, you have to make coalition and you need to work together in, in these things. And, and I remember the right wing guy and the left wing lady, and they were talking and they were talking about like healthcare or something. And, and it was, the debate went something like this. Well, of course I support healthcare or whatever the policy was. Of course I do. And, and what I'm saying is not that uh, we shouldn't kill it, but I'm saying, you know, we should take a, a 4% tax rate to do this thing versus a 3%. And that was the conservative versus the liberal and just being able to say, you know, we're all going for the same thing. We care about, you know, the health of our country or whatever right. it is. Um, and the far right and the far left were arguing about percentages of amount of money they should spend on whatever policy this was. And they were calling each other sir and ma'am, and they were being very friendly and cordial. And I'm like, oh, there's something fundamentally broken about our system. When it was just like, I hear what you're saying, says the right wing guy to the left wing lady. I, you, you, all your points are valid, and I agree with all of them. This one, this one, and this one. But this point you know, about the 4% versus 6% taxing, I don't know about that. Yeah. And I was like, oh. You can, you can come up with, like, and, and this is another thing I believe about people. Like, there's this core of things that we all want, like, and, and we all want those things. And then there's the, the fringes around the outside of it that we like to argue about. And I, I think that that is stoked and driven by people. The, the three people out of 100 who don't want that core thing. Yeah. Stoke the angers and the, and the frustrations around the, around the margins so that that thing will never get done. It's like you're talking about the the uh, the six hundred dollar checks or two thousand dollar checks or whatever you want to call it. Everybody wants that. Everybody's like, yeah. Except there's one dude who doesn't. I don't know who that dude or dudette is. I could guess. And so they put all these writers on and the things they're going to argue about and things that take something that should have been a five minute discussion. Should we give six hundred or two thousand? Let's talk about that. And made it into this thing that was unpassable for seven months. Yeah. That that's not a mistake. That's being done. No, it on purpose by people who are trying to get at that core of the thing and make it never happen. Mm -hmm. and, and it's our system just set up like that. And that's where the violence comes from. Um, and I'm not a violent person. I'm a, I'm highly pacifistic, but again, not, not condoning, but understanding, I think is an important thing to do. And even those people the other day, I, I get it. I I'm appalled by it. I would never do that. I think that they're destroying our country but I get why they're doing it. It's, it's just sad and it's horrible. And it's depressing. That's why I didn't want to talk about all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You did a good job though. Yeah. So well, anyway, very nicely put. Yeah. It's nice to vent in a way that doesn't involve me going. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's funny, like, you know, again, the media, like are, taking all of your thoughts and condensing them down to a single picture or, or meme or 144 characters has got to be one of the most intellectually damaging thing to, to discussion ever. Like it's just, it's, these, it's, no one can have any, any decent discussion about anything. I, so I read this great book. I told you about this book earlier and then I'll stop, uh, but it's called actually the righteous mind uh, as an example. And it's by Jonathan Haidt, who's a UVA professor. And it's all about these moral foundations uh, of things. And, uh, and, you know, like I said, I'm a very liberal person and I read it because it's like why people disagree on things moralistically. And he had some really, really good points. And he turns out he's a little bit more conservative than me. He's actually, I think he might be more libertarian, but he lays out this framework that's really good. And I thought did a wonderful job of helping me empathize with people who don't agree with me and understanding where they come from. And so I would suggest people read it. But then I got into this thing. I told my friend, who's also very liberal. Uh, hell, you should read it. It really is very good. And she went on Best Reads and it was just being bashed by people that were just, you know, 
canceling it. They're just like, oh, this guy's trying to convince you to be a right wing person. I'm like, he's got some really good points about things. And, and it's very eloquently put and very non-threatening to which of course people are like well that's because he's trying to trick you and i'm like no it doesn't have to be trying to trick me to, to make a point point." and in fact he was a left a, a liberal person who over the course of a 20-year period of studying moral psychology changed his opinions about things and i'm like that's a valuable thing to look at you should look mm -hmm. at that anyway that's a great book you should people should read that book i'm thinking about that a lot right now i will uh actually put that in the show notes and i i wrote it down so you know it's it uh Sounds interesting. Yeah, um, more psychology, which I know. I, I and I like psychology. I, I do. I I I you know I like that aspect of things. The uh, <clears throat> the only thing that uh, that yeah, you know, I really don't have anything else to say on on the matter. To be honest with you, I I just I, I'm still kind of stunned at what happened. And and kind of sick of uh, of this riot mentality where oh we're just going to go ahead and bust this down and do this and do that and everything else and you know I, I mean I I laugh at the guy who tased himself in the balls and died of a heart attack I mean you know okay that's you know that really I don't know but it's a it it's a story on social media and it's like well if it really happened that is kind of funny you yeah. know Darwin um, Award. Yeah, Dar it was a Darwin type thing, but uh, you know, other than that, I don't think there's a hell of a lot funny about uh, you know people barging in and trying to stop the election because they think it was stolen or whatever. But uh, you know, whatever. Um, with that, do you have any closing thoughts, or are you done? No, no I, I think I got to get to work. So it's funny we have people are showing up in my house to do work, and my dog is barking, and my wife and child are trying to constrain him. So. <laughs> so so uh, I think the world just fell apart on me here. So, um, well, you know what? With that, we'll go ahead and call this a close. Um, Chris, it's been it's been great talking to you. I hope we do it again when your next book comes out. Uh, yeah. Um, th thank you uh, so much for your time. Uh, I guess what I'd say is my book is available on Amazon and Audible, and uh, you should check it out. Yep, all those links will be there, and you'll see it when uh, when I publish this. You'll see all the links and everything to your book and, and everything else. Um, appreciate you and your dogs and uh, and your family over there, and and hope you're uh, having a good time today. This is Jeff with the DIY Writer telling you, you know what? Keep your chin up; it's going to get better. Anyway, yep, I hope so. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. Yep, Have yep. a great day. Right. Bye, bye bye. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber and I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me please.